Hi, everyone. I am delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Lawrence Allison. Lawrence holds a chair in forensic and investigative psychology at the University of Liverpool. His work is focused on high profile critical and major incidents. He's published widely on critical incident decision making, interrogation of high value detainees, and risk prioritization of sexual and violent offenders. His work has been used by UK police, the Home Secretary, the UK Joint Forces Intelligence Group, the FBI, CIA, Department of Defense, and others. He's also been a PI on high profile grants from the Home Office, Department of Defense, European Commission, and the FBI. And recently he's received an MBE for services to critical incident handling and to the NHS during COVID. Following Lawrence's talk, we will have two discussants, Drs. Jim Turner and Zoe Walkington, both of whom are members of the Forensic Cognition Research Group, one of the research strands in the Open Psychology Research Center. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Lawrence. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, now, what button do I press? I'm, this, this is terrible, isn't it? We've got to start off with our slides. I'm just getting them up now. They'll be two Ah, slides. no worries. OK, Jim, I will leave it to you. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Uh, thank, thanks for joining us in the afternoon session. Uh, I've got to say my first sort of uh, five, ten minutes of this are a, a little bit grim, to be honest. I mean, given that we're talking about, you know, the the uh, detention of an interrogation of high value detainees, um, you know, there's some pretty horrific acts that we'll be talking about. Obviously, I won't be showing anything too grim or discussing anything too graphic, but nonetheless, we're going to be talking about some difficult uh, topics at the front end of this. And in fact, um, you know, I'm judging by the sort of presentations that we've had so far, I'm guessing that most of the research that has been covered today and is normally talked about psychologists, uh, by psychologists is sort of celebrating the efficacy and interventions that psychologists have, have uh, been involved in. Um, but it is incumbent on us to discuss um, some of the abuses that psychologists have inflicted uh, on other people. And that's that's kind of where I want to start, really. So it's a, it's a bit, as I say, it's a bit of a grim start, to be honest, but um, but we'll uh, hopefully end up in a slightly happier place. Um, so, yeah, my name is Professor Lawrence Allison. Uh, I work on three different areas of research. Uh, I do some stuff on interviewing. I do some stuff on child protection and I do um, some work on decision making. But the topic that I'm going to be talking about today is indeed my work on uh, interrogation. Um, so let's start with a little bit of history. Um, we need to start with this gentleman, a guy called Alan Dulles. Um, and his, in fact, I fly into Dulles Airport regularly to work with the Terror Screening Centre to support their activity in interviewing. But actually it was Dulles that started off, in at least in the States, a uh, historical journey which was very dark. And it was when the US was facing defeat when it intervened in the Korean War and basically it was ill prepared. It suffered heavy casualties. And before the intervention of the Chinese forces, US soldiers were usually executed, executed by North Korean personnel. But in fact, when the Chinese joined the fight, uh, they were holding a number of prisoners of war. And although a number of those US Army troops were taken prisoner and the death toll was pretty horrendous, actually, uh, there were roughly 40% uh, didn't survive as prisoners of war. Um, they were subjected to starvation, isolation, steep, sleep deprivation and freezing conditions. And as prisoners of war, when they came back to the States, those that survived um, were classified as suffering from what the Americans called give it up itis. And the US uh, forces imagined actually that um, they'd been brainwashed, that there were some sophisticated um, methods that the Chinese were using to try and encourage people to become sleeper agents. And the, the fact of the matter probably was this, this basic physiological uh, suffering and starvation and isolation that these guys had gone through rather than any sophisticated brainwashing techniques. But uh, that said, the US were firmly in the belief that there was, I think, probably through the paranoia of what was was happening with these guys when they came back, that they'd actually been brainwashed by the Chinese in some way. And that led to a program called MK Ultra, which is very much worth looking up. In fact, for those of you that are Netflix fans, um, there's a couple of uh, good dramatizations of both the Unabomber 
and and the Unabomber was subject to the MK Ultra pro, uh, program of research. And in fact, uh, there's another program which is the name of which I forget now. But if you Google MK Ultra and look up Netflix, there is an actual documentary about the instigators of the MK Ultra program. But the point was, it was set up by Dulles to look at techniques to basically uh, brainwash prisoners of war. And it's super sinister. I mean, this is not well discussed by psychologists, um, but psychologists were involved in it. And not only were psychologists involved in it, uh, roughly 80 uh, reputable institutions, academic institutions across the states were involved in this programme, knowingly, knowingly, uh, in terms of what it involved. In fact, in 1953, the CIA MK Ultra programme, 80 well-respected institutions were involved, and it was approved by Sidney Gottlieb, who I think was actually a chemist, um, but a number of psychologists, sociologists, criminologists were involved in this programme. And it was conducted on individuals, some of whom were students, uh, that were guinea pigs for the CIA. So they were enrolled into programmes of research, used as participants, but basically did ha they had no awareness that this was a CIA operative programme. And the idea was to look at research to break people down, basically to remove their identity, this is a slight oversimplification, but basically to remove their identity and convert them into sleeper agents and, and to, to establish what it was that the Chinese were doing, even though it's quite likely the Chinese weren't actually doing anything very sophisticated. Now, slightly tragically as well, and this is a repeating pattern that we see throughout history, all the information that was captured on those participants was later destroyed. So any accusations that were then levelled at Richard Helms, who was the gentleman in the swish suit with the dark hair on the right of your screen, uh, was removed. And that, as you'll see, becomes a repeating pattern when we talk post 9-11. Um, that said, now there were some sinister things that were going on in MK Ultra um, that were based on work that was going on before that. So we might, as Brits, sort of look down our noses at these terrible things that the Americans were doing. But in fact, we were doing them well before the Americans. And actually, we were the instigators of many of the ideas that sat behind things like the MK Ultra program. Uh, Cameron, Donald Ewan Cameron was was key in this. There's a great film documentary called Eminent Monsters. If you um, I wouldn't suggest it as Friday evening viewing. It's not terribly upbeat, I have to say, but it's an important program to look at. And it's about the life of Cameron. He held senior positions in the Canadian American and World Psychiatric Association and the American Psychopathological Association and the Society of Biological Psychiatry. He possibly, I mean, arguably may well have started with the right intent. I mean, he did some work in the Nuremberg trials. He was actually asked to assess Rudolf Hess, although he erroneously classified him as having amnesia, which we know Hess was faking. Um, but his intention was to use the behavioural sciences to mitigate the threat of atomic warfare. He believed that society could be split into the weak and the strong, and those suffering from mental health issues are not just sick, but weak. Um, he had a very strong sort of positive uh, authoritarianism about being in control and controlling sick, toxic societies. You know, and these are all quotes from Cameron. Stamp out the contagion of mental health by relying on creating strong, disciplined society. So he might have had the right intentions in terms of ameliorating what was, you know, a pretty dreadful situation post-war. But his kind of autocratic authoritarian stance on it, um, you know, it's pretty revealing about the, the pathway that he took. Um, and so he was also funded by the MK Ultra program later under the pretense of treating individuals often admitted with only minor anxiety disorders submitted as test subjects to supercharged electroconvulsive therapy, sometimes up to 40 times the normal charge. The inducement of paralytic drugs to create drug induced comas with one test subject in a drug induced coma for three months and very extensive periods of isolation. So this all happened at various different psychiatric hospitals under the auspices of treating anxiety disorders, but actually subjecting people through funded research by the um, CIA to these pretty horrific programs of research to, to, to not really treat them, but actually to look at the, these methods that Helms and Dulles were interested in. Another key individual that, that Cameron was inspired by and worked along with was William Sargent. And uh, I'm not gonna read the full slide there, but, but, but Sargent also was involved in electroconvulsive therapy. He also was a committed advocate of isolation. Uh, he also uh, uh, 
brought in unwilling test subjects or people that basically were unable to fend for themselves. And that included some re returning war veterans and even some orphans. So a pretty horrific litany of extensive abuse um, at the hands of these people that were there allegedly to help and given extensive amounts of money as well, may I say, to support it. So now updating a little bit, I told you we'd start dark and hopefully improve shortly. <laughs> Just a few more slightly grim slides to go through. But what I would say is I think this is important because, you know, do we really teach our undergraduates about this? Not really. You know, they're, they're not getting this at first, second and third year. You know, even I asked my, my third year undergraduates about what Seligman may or may not have done or do they know the name Ewan Cameron? And most of them don't know it. And I think, you know, it is a warning from history. But most students will know of Seligman and his work on learned helplessness, but most students may not know of how that work was corrupted, how it was used, how it was re-engineered or reverse engineered um, by these characters, uh, Mitchell and Jessen, James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen, also psychologists, but members of the Air Force. And post 9-11, they were paid $180 million for subjecting detainees to ice baths, rectal rehydration, enclosing people in boxes filled with insects and mock burials. I mean, horrific sort of forms of abuse to isolate, break people down and destroy their will and to get them to confess to things that they may or may not have done. Again, like their predecessors, they emerged in the wake of severe threats. And again, as with MK Ultra, the academic community at best turned a blind eye to this. So if you look at the, the history of this, the APA, American Psychological Association, kind of washed their hands of it until it was brought up as a problem, and then they had to look at it. But the, I think the, the, the even more sort of troubling thing about the APA's response to this was, oh yes, actually, yes, now we admit it was dreadful. And therefore, what's our approach to this? Well, psychologists should have nothing to do with interrogations. You know, So I get the idea of the Hippocratic Oath don't do any harm, but to, to sort of walk away and say, yeah, we did screw up here, but actually we're now not going to do anything to help in any way is, is, is also damaging. And like Helms before him, Jose Rodriguez, who was the ex-CIA chief at that time, also destroyed the 92 videotapes of those abuses. So again, you know, very conveniently, what Rodriguez will say in his book, Hard Measures, look, these things worked. These things work. These measures work. You have no idea how important it was that they were they worked. But all the tapes are destroyed, so we can never know. What I can say um, is that based on what I've looked at, which is a pretty extensive set of videos now, um, I have never seen any of these harsh techniques work. In fact, the complete opposite. They, they shut people down, they stop them talking, um, and at best, they may get them talking about something which subsequently turns out not to be true. Because if you imagine you're about to be tortured, you'll literally say anything to stop the abuse happening. So they're highly problematic techniques. So this is not just about the moral, legal um, and ethical repugnance of these techniques. You know, as a scientist, if I if I were looking at those 92 tapes and I was analysing them, submitting them to behavioural coding, and I found that they worked, that they were actually getting people engaged, they were telling the truth, they did, I would have to say that, right? But the point is, um, they don't work. You know, not only are they repugnant, they don't actually work. Um, and in fact, there's plenty of evidence, um, anecdotal and more systematic, that those people that had undergone torture, is just three key figures, Baghdadi, Zawahiri and uh, Syed Qutb, all of whom were key figures in Al-Qaeda or ISIS, and all of whom had been detained in various different prisons, and all of whom had been tortured. So, you know, if you want to generate a propaganda tool for a terrorist um, group, then go and torture key members that are going to form that group and, you know, ossify, cement, uh, and make their views more extreme. So, in times of crisis, what you tend to find, and I mean, it's been happening for, since the 16th century, really. I mean, if you look at the witch, the witch finder days of uh, Matthew Hopkins, exactly the same thing. When communities are under stress or in fear, what you tend to, to have develop is a sort of try anything approach in which even when initial efforts and intentions are sour, are good, they sour quickly. They're then rapidly diverted into assisting with the development of morally dubious methods when a significant threat emerges. And in Mitchell and Jessen's case, this began with championing Seligman's learned helplessness paradigm. 
Seligman stated, I'm grieved and, grieved and horrified that good science, which has helped so many people overcome depression, may have been used for such bad purposes. Now, that said, depending on who you wish to believe, there are others that will claim Seligman knew exactly what was going on. Now, we may never know, um, but I would encourage people to read Mark Fallon's book um, called Unjustifiable Means, which is a very good an interesting biographic account of the guy that was the key whistleblower blower, uh, from Department of Defence at Abu Ghraib um, that argued that Seligman was aware of what was going on. Now, I, I don't know why the where's and why falls of, of the extent of his involvement or not, but the point is, as psychologists, if we know how to heal, we obviously know how to wound. So we have to be cognizant of that um, that 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 knowledge. Right, so moving on to slightly brighter uh, um, areas, I hope. Uh, where do we come into all this? So, well, we were aware of these problems, obviously, as 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 uh, uh, time emerged and the APA uncovered what was going on. And uh, on Obama's inauguration uh, in 2012, the High Value Detainee Interrogation Group was formed, which was formed from three services: the CIA, the Department of Defense, and the FBI. And Obama um, allocated a fairly significant budget, I think $17 million, to um, a research cohort. And we were one, one party uh, uh, that, that received some funding, I have to say a very trivial amount of funding compared to the 17 million, I think it's about 120,000. And we were the only party that managed to secure um, field-based interrogations, the real thing. And uh, for those of you that know my work, I'm pretty sceptical of lab based research trying to replicate problems like this. Um, I'm not entirely dismissive of it, but I've seen a lot of research and actually worryingly, I mean, maybe want to pick this up in the, the Q&A session. This year, I've had six papers to review, all of which are lab based pieces of research and which I think are a worrying trend. Well, it's hard to say it's a trend with only five, but every single piece of research I've received from three journals recently has been lab based research using students as participants and arguing for kind of Cialdini level social persuasion tricks to use on detainees. And I think that is worrying. Uh, yes, we can all agree that using uh, physical or psychological abuses on people is not appropriate, but do we really want to be using kind of Cialdini sales pitch techniques on suspects? I think not. And that is a worrying trend that I'm seeing. Um, anyway, I digress. So, so we secured some funding to look at this and we looked at roughly 2000 hours worth of material of interrogations with uh, real detainees. For those of you that are interested, there's a couple of books there that we've written recently. The one on your right, Rapport, The Four Ways to Read People, is a popular textbook, Penguin, just about general issues around rapport building. The one on the left is about the model that we developed, Orbit, and that is the more academic book published by Oxford University Press and talks specifically about this, I don't know, 10 or 12 papers that we've now published in this domain of interest. Um, so our research was based on uh, two sort of godfathers uh, of uh, psychology. I mean, interesting, both both highly bizarre characters. Tim Leary's work, uh, for those of you that know, is a very strange character that kind of dropped out latterly in his career, but certainly at the early stage of his career was, was a very eminent psychologist that was looking at personality theory. And his key issue really was looking at the interpersonal um, elements of personality theory and a key argument was not to dismiss a kind of trait based approach to personality, but to encourage a method of observation and analysis, which looked at not just the individual as an individual, but an individual in the way in which they interacted in the world and with other people. Um, he developed a thing called the interpersonal circle, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but basically, he was interested in, in the interactions between people that, that described the different ways that people navigated through life, not as a personality theory, but as an interpersonality theory. So we drew heavily on his work and we drew on his work because in the interrogation room, we feel there's two things that need consideration. The first is the management of the behaviour that you see in the room. And sometimes detainees are relatively easy to manage. They are interpersonally appropriate and they are cooperative and so on. But as Zoe will know, sometimes they are not. They can be highly aggressive. They can be incredibly quiet and resistant. 
Um, they can be very driven by conflict or they can be sort of kind of pseudo cooperative, waffling all over the place, but not actually saying anything. <clears throat> so we felt that Leary's work was particularly amenable to looking at this idea that you had to manage people differently contingent on the people that you actually had in the interrogation room. So, so we drew heavily on Leary. Uh, Malton Marston, not going to say too much about Marston, um, but he also was interested in the interpersonal intersection between two people. Um, interestingly, um, also a bit of an oddball, um, developed this so-called DISC theory about dominance, inducement, submission and compliance, uh, which also un undoubtedly informed Leary's thinking and was a pretty controversial figure as well. He also dropped out in various different ways. Um, inter incidentally, for those of you that want this pub quiz knowledge, was also the creator of Wonder Woman. So there you go, slightly random, but there you go. And then the other person that we draw on very heavily is Carl Rogers' work. Um, he's kind of sort of been slightly sidelined by the academic community, perhaps to some extent. Um, I was just reading a, a, an older paper of his in this excellent book, Carl Rogers' Reader, um, a paper that he wrote in 1985 about why humanistic psychology was being was being sidelined. And his argument, in a sense, which I think is still true, I mean, in the paper in 1985, he says, well, I see a wind of change coming and maybe we will be more sort of up for looking at humanistic psychology. But his argument, in a sense, was he felt that humanistic psychology was too applied, too much about problem solving, and therefore was dismissed by the academic community. And my goodness, isn't that still true now? I mean, for sort of 25 years uh, of my career, I think I've been looked down on a little bit for being an applied psychologist and a problem solver. Um, but, you know, I guess we would like to think post pandemic that actually we as psychologists have a role to play and surely part of our role to play is solving problems, is it not? I have no issue with basic research or, you know, leaning heavily on the theory side. But at some point in time, I think it is incumbent on us to be able to, you know, stand up in a room and have a you know random selection of the general public come in and ask us, what do you get paid? And what have you done? Why are we paying you this money? What 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 are you what have you actually done to help anyone? And if you can't answer that in some meaningful way, I think you need to take a bit of a look inside yourself. Um, but I think it's still true for for Rogers that really, you know, if you're doing this kind of help help based research uh, and it's problem solving and it's solving immediate problems on the horizon, then then it is slightly looked down upon by certain. Um, factions of the academic community. You can feel yourself very sidelined. But Roger's work was instructive for us as well because it was about authenticity, it was about honesty, it was about providing autonomy and choice. And that, of course, is enshrined in the very principles of police interviewing. You do not have to say anything, but anything you may, you may say may be taken as evidence. So Roger's work really combined with Leary's, these two things that we wanted to bring together that were really to do with encouraging interviewers to loosen up a bit rather than be kind of mechanistic robots and treat everyone the same way, to be cognizant of the idea that different people needed different management methods, needed to be interpersonally managed, and you needed to be sensitive to these variations. I mean, if I was interviewing my 17-year-old son for an alleged crime, I might deal with him differently than if I was, you know, interviewing Zoe or one of the, my police colleagues or whoever. The point is, you know, people need different management. We need to be sensitive to that. But underneath all of that is Rogers's work about authenticity, honesty and non-judgment. Um, so moving on, when we were developing our methods here, again, I'm not going to go into this in any great depth, but when we were formulating what we were doing, we were very sensitive to the idea that it had to be compliant with UK law enforcement. It had to be compliant with uh, UNHR. It had to be compliant with peace and pace codes, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, and it had to have an honesty about it. And this is this is why I worry that I see these papers recently talking about, you know, principles of reciprocity or scarcity and trying to induce people to say something that they might not otherwise say. Our stuff is always about being very direct. It's about giving the person a choice whether they will talk or not and really selling that choice to them. I mean, we see police officers that go through the caution in a very robotic way or will even say things like, well, I've got to do this bit at the front end. You know, it's about your rights and then we'll get on with the interview. And we always say, no, no, hang on a minute. Sell the caution to them. Make it clear that that is their right and it is their legal right and they need to think about it carefully. Um, and, you know, perhaps counterintuitively, I mean, some some cops will sort of resist this, say, oh, my God, I don't want to reinforce the caution too much because in it, it says that you can say nothing. And we say, yeah, 
<laughs> that's their legal right. Make sure they understand that. And actually, the more you lay on thick the idea that that really is their choice and you do it in a genuine and authentic way, they genuinely will think more carefully and considerately about whether they will talk. And actually, sometimes it is in their interest to talk. You know, sometimes solicitors will be will treat their advice as if it's an instruction and it's not. It's advice. So it's not up to me as the interviewer whether the person should talk. It's also not up to the solicitor. It's up to the person that sat in the seat. So, um, you know, holding to those Rogerian principles is is important. So we had roughly 2000 hours worth of material, all kinds of different terrorists that we looked at. <coughs> and we've done many, many different analyses on these. And um, I've got about 20 minutes to sort of provide you with the sort of rough overview of the model. Um, so we're going to crack on straight with that. So so the model is called Orbits based on the Leary wheel. And um, to, to get this in your heads quickly, let's go through a very simplified version of it. So Leary argued, so you'll remember I was talking about this idea of the two elements that we drew on Roger's work and Leary's work. So from Leary's point of view, the Leary work, in this is gross simplification, so, so you'll have to excuse me for simplifying it quite so grossly. Um, but Leary's argument was that in any given interaction, you had two axes that were at play. The first was known as agency or power. And in any given interaction, you will always have someone that is higher uh, than the other person in that interaction. And by higher, I mean more in charge. There might be different degrees of intensity of that with someone being very dominant or very submissive. But the interaction basically isn't going to work if both people are jockeying for that dominant position. Now, there's a degree of proportionality that, that must be exerted here. And Leary talks about any behaviour becoming extreme is a problematic behaviour. So being in charge, setting the agenda and advising might be an appropriate level of dominance. But once that tips into being demanding, rigid, dogmatic and pedantic, then you've escalated it too much. <coughs> Equally, if you're talking about cooperation, being social, warm and friendly is an appropriate level of cooperation. But being obsequious and over familiar is too far. Similarly, being submissive, sometimes it's appropriate to be humble, seeking guidance and patient, but dropping down into being weak and being a pushover is inappropriate. And finally, even conflict is an important archetypal interpersonal behaviour to, 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 to hit, correct, and being frank and forthright and clear and clean in what it is that you're saying that you disagree with is important, but you do not need to be sarcastic, attacking and punitive. So when we're talking to our interrogators about interpersonal behaviour, we talk about, I mean, sometimes we help them visualise it with these little, I don't know why, but cops seem to like these little visual images of the lion, the monkey, the mouse and the T-Rex. It helps them visualise it. That's fine. So we talk about any one of these styles being an adaptive variant or a maladaptive variant of these four archetypes. That yes, sometimes in the interview, if you've got a very lower detainee a lower person that's being quite quiet and submissive it's appropriate for you to be in charge setting the agenda and advising because that that works that symmetry works but it's not appropriate to be demanding dogmatic and pedantic monkey or cooperative behavior as i've said social warm and friendly not over familiar mouse patient pensive and reserved but not formulate disengage and conflict avoidant and t-rex frank forth and critical um, but not sarcastic attacking and punitive so what we often do with cops is we will watch them interact with one of our role players who often is pretty awful in various different ways and we'll give them some of these maladaptive behaviors on the part of the detainee and see how they respond and part of it is about creating the emotional the emotional self-regulation within the police officer to not attack back when attacked yeah to not bow down and get bullied when you're on the receiving end of the bad line so we're often the first thing we're sort of teaching them is, is to kind of emotionally self-regulate what are predictable natural forms of behaviour, but are not productive and trying to manage and make those more proportionate and uh, effective. OK, so. Oops. Wow. The slide. Um, so why are we not on that slide? So so moving on to the MI uh, Rogerian work. Um, after Rogers, I mean, many of you will be familiar with this if you're from clinical backgrounds, the concept of motivational interviewing emanated out of these Rogerian principles and Miller and Rolnick's work we drew on pretty heavily as well. 
Um, the idea that basically, I mean, as many of you will know, Miller was was a particularly successful counsellor in working with um, uh, the, the addictions arena. And a lot of that was to do with not just the intervention, whether it's a particular form of um, uh, psychological intervention, but how he actually came across as a therapist, not trying to force the person or rationally corner them into accepting a form of therapy or change, but actually listening to them properly, actively listening. And I think your last speaker was talking about this and, you know, I'm sure you've had this echo throughout the day, being able to listen and take on board a view without judging it, rationalising it, cornering it or arguing with it. But but basically first listen. Um, and Miller and Rolnick's work has, has been very instructive in sort of moving us along as well. It's more persuasive than coercive, more supportive than argumentative, and change arises from within. Now, it might feel a bit odd to be talking about these sorts of principles when we're talking about the interrogation room, but all of our research suggests these work. You know, they work very effectively. These concepts of acceptance, adaptation, autonomy, empathy, and evocation. You know, the idea of not leaking judgment or personal opinion about actions, belief statements by the suspect, the idea of alter, uh, altering uh, the agenda in response to the suspect rather than rigid adherence to an interview plan, being a bit more flexible, a bit more fluid. The idea of respecting or emphasising the suspect's right to choose to cooperate, to speak, <coughs> to engage or not, providing them some choice and control. So often we hear interviewers say, well, this is my interview and I'm in control. And I always say, well, actually, you're totally not in control, because if I'm the suspect, I will choose whether I speak to you. So the more you accept that actually the suspect is in control and make them feel in control because they are in control, the better. Empathy as well, displaying genuine understanding of the suspect's actions or mindset. Now, empathy is a really interesting one because the other thing that we've done in our training work is we've looked to see whether we can increase these qualities in our interrogators. So we have a six day program with them. We have them eight hours a day. They're doing role plays with you know really difficult suspects every day. And we have indeed been able to shift them up. We take a measure beforehand. We look at their interviews before they come on the course. We look at their interviews after the course. And in fact, it'd be very interesting to hear back from you guys as to what we can do about this. The one property that we cannot seem to shift is empathy. You know, if you take a measure of a cop's empathy on day one in, in their interviews, by day five, by day six, that is the only thing we can't seem to shift. And you'll know if you're from a clinical background that empathy is not this touchy feely, warm, huggy sort of uh, uh, property. But, you know, I'd like to see, see it more as an act of um, imagination uh, that, that requires the interrogator. I mean, in some ways, in quite a cold way to be very sort of antiseptic and clinical about trying to imagine what it is like for the person that is sat opposite them. Not in a way that is um, soft or in the conventional way that we talk about soft skills, but actually really listening to what has been said, not putting themselves in the chair, but trying to imagine what it's like for that person. And to give an example, you know, um, we had two uh, West Yorkshire officers big rugby playing lads interviewing a 19 year old young lady um, from Pakistan who had held some very strong uh, fundamentalist beliefs and they were very empathic with her insofar as they were trying, you could see in the way that they were interviewing, they weren't putting themselves as white 30 year old rugby playing males in her position. They were trying to imagine what it was like, not necessarily succeeding, but making the cognitive effort to imagine what it might be like for a young female from that background by very gently exploring what it was that she was saying without without any judgment or um, uh, or assumptions. So empathy seems to be a really hard one to shift. We have found that either cops seem to have it or they don't, but actually packing it in their head and making them behaviourally change seems to be a real challenge. And then the fifth and final property that we found is really important is this property of evocation, which is mentioned throughout the MI literature as well. But it's to do with eliciting statements from the suspect about their thoughts, feelings, and underlying core values and beliefs. If you cannot access, as a police officer, thoughts, feelings, and beliefs, you won't actually get to facts, evidence, and information. You know, human beings are not fact-giving machines that simply because you have asked a set of questions will give you the answers. If you can't explore what the value system is, you can't engage with the person and you can't you can't get the goals of the the SIO. So the combination of that, I know I've 
appreciate I've skirted over it incredibly quickly, but it's the combination of the interpersonal elements of managing the person that's in front of you, depending on where they are sat and how they're behaving, and taking into the interview room a value system that is based really on these kind of Rogerian principles, authenticity, honesty. And we found, I mean, even in really difficult interviews where we've had military personnel <coughs> had to give a very difficult message um, to certain people in, in various different camps about the, the, um, the removal of their British citizenship, um, uh, telling people that, they've, that, that, that someone has died and then asking them for information. But, the, but because they've been so upfront and honest and authentic about what's going on, they tend to be the ones that are much more successful at securing information. This idea that you can trick, dupe, get around the side of someone, you know, is highly problematic. And of course, once you've been found out as using those tricks, that person has lost all trust. So it's really this combination of these kind of Rogerian humanistic principles alongside the interpersonal management of the detainee that secures very considerable success. So without boring you with the coding system, you know, we had a we had a, 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 com a pretty complex coding system, which has gradually become a bit more efficient and clean as we've gone on. But we we coded these interpersonal behaviours on the, the, the part of the, the subject, the suspect, and also the interviewers or interrogators. We also coded what we called the yield, the amount of information that came from the suspect. And that related to things like capability, opportunity and motive for the commission, preparation or instigation of the offence, as well as details around people, location, action and time. So to what extent do these interpersonal behaviours that are managed successfully or not, and these behaviours that are to do with kind of motivational interviewing or humanistic principles, encourage people to talk about the facts, about, about true information? We also had what we called a detainee engagement scale, which went from one, detainee says nothing at all at any point during the interview, right the way through to a very detailed account uh, of their actions. Uh, I won't play the video because I'm just conscious of time, actually. And so I'm going to end on this slightly horrifying slide. Apologies for this. My old lecturer used to say, never, ever put anything on a slide that you wouldn't put on a T-shirt. So I have just broken that rule. But let me just sort of end on, on the sort of basic conclusions that we found. So this is a structural equation model, and I'm just going to run through quickly with you um, the interaction between these, these effects. So I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see my cursor. You can't see my cursor moving on the slide, can you? Or can you? No. OK, so if you look to the left of your screen in the boxes, you will see a thing which says int adaptive and debt adaptive and debt maladaptive and debt and um, uh, sorry, debt maladaptive and debt um, adaptive. You'll then see in these bubbles the word yield and motivational interviewing. So let's go through these interactions. And in brief, what you have is what you might expect. So what we've got here are the interpersonal wheels, the, the bad wheel and the good wheel on the part of the suspect and on the part of the interrogator. Then you have the yield, which is the thing that you want, the information, which is to do with people, location, location, action and time, capability, opportunity and motive. That's the thing that we want more of, right? And then at the bottom, we have these motivational interviewing qualities, which are autonomy, empathy, acceptance, adaptation and evocation. So let's look at these interactions. So the first one is this. If you have an interviewer on the bad wheel, so they are using behaviours which are extreme variations of dominance, submission, cooperation or conflict. So they've gone too far in these domains. What you tend to create within the suspect is the mirror version of the suspect behaving badly as well. So, for example, if you get a highly dominant interviewer that has gone from being in charge, setting the agenda to, and advising to being demanding, dogmatic, pedantic and, and uh, aggressive, that will push the detainee down into being weak and pathetic, basically. So that bullying works and therefore maladaptive interviewing creates maladaptive behaviour on the part of the suspect. That then leads to a decrease in yield. Yeah. So bad interviewer behaviour creates bad detainee behaviour, reduces yield. Completely predictable. Yeah. Equally, even in conditions where bad interviewer behaviour does not directly influence or have a knock on effect on the subject, it still reduces yield. So there's an indirect and a direct effect. It's a bit like if you imagine a snooker ball hitting another snooker ball to hit the third ball into the pocket. 
you know, you hit the white ball to hit the black ball to hit the pink ball. That's your that's your your effect of bad interviewer, bad detainee, less in less yield. But also you can just hit the ball straight into the pocket badly, which is bad interviewer hasn't the detainee quite surprisingly hasn't gone bad, but will still tell you less. It's almost like the detainee goes, OK, you're being a bit of an ass, but I don't need to be. But I'm still not going to tell you anything. OK, so you've got an indirect and a direct effect. We'll come to the, the interviewer adaptive behaviour in a minute, but let's just divert into the motivational interviewing Rogerian stuff. The second finding that's really important is the more you take into that interview room, this value system of acceptance, adaptation, empathy, evocation, the more you will get the person engaged. If you, it doesn't matter how you get there, but having that atmosphere in the room produces a sub subject which is more engaged and more prepared to talk to you. They don't feel judged, they feel understood, they feel listened to, they feel that you're going to be di direct and honest with them, and therefore they are much more inclined to talk. It doesn't work every time, but it's a very powerful, exerts a very, very powerful effect on whether or not you get information. So we've got this, this, this predictable maladaptive set, you know, if you, if you mismanage the interpersonal behaviour, you don't get information. If you do stuff which is antithetical to Rogerian principles, you don't get information. If you do the Rogerian stuff, you do get information. Now, here's the interesting, perhaps counterintuitive one. It is true that the more that you stick on the good interpersonal wheel, so you moderate your behaviour proportionately, the more likely you are to influence the detainee to mirror you. So there is a mirroring effect, if you like, of me as interviewer, is appropriate, encourages you as interviewee to be appropriate, increases engagement, increases yield. Exactly the same effect, but in reverse for the maladaptive behaviours. But there is one counterintuitive finding, and it is this. We did find, you remember I told you about the maladaptive interviewing, that even if it doesn't affect the detainee, they still don't produce yield. Well, there is no effect of the, there's no direct effect of interviewer being good on yield. So there's interviewer good, subject good, increase in information. There's interviewer good, no effect on uh, increase in information. And the question is why? Now that uh, seems counterintuitive, but what we found was this. You do get some interviewers that are, that stay on the adaptive wheel. So they are adapted throughout the whole interrogation, the whole interview. They never go onto the bad wheel. They never go bad T-Rex. They never go bad lion. They never go bad mouse. They never go bad monkey, right? But that is not in and of itself sufficient. The interviewer has to be versatile enough to respond to the detainee. And if they don't, that effect starts to wear thin. And you can imagine, can't you? If you're, a, and this goes back to the point that I made very early doors here, that you have to be able to treat and respond to people differently. Imagine if you've got an organised crime gang lord who's very high on dominance, and you as an interviewer all the way through are just social woman friendly. Social woman friendly, interview one. Social woman friendly, interview two. That isn't going to wash with a person that's been through the system 30 or 40 times. You have to adapt and be able to flex. So the three properties in a nutshell, and I'll end on this line so that we've got a little bit of time for questions. The three properties in summary that we found discriminate our elite interviewers from our less good interviewers are the following. First, elite interviewers are what we call interpersonally competent. What does that mean? Well, basically that means they stay off the bad wheel. They never become extreme. They can be dominant, but not too dominant. They can be cooperative, but not too cooperative. They can be submissive, but not too weak. And they can engage in conflict without becoming attacking. So they are devoid of these properties that we, as we reach social maturation, should start avoiding. You know, basically interpersonal will stuff is kind of immature uh, emotional dysregulation or inability to control ourselves adequately. Our elite interviewers, even in the face of pretty appalling behaviour, can stay in that zone. They can stay proportionate. So that's the first thing. The second thing is they are what we call interpersonally sensitive. They are good at accurately and efficiently and expeditious, expeditiously identifying what behaviour they've got in front of them. So they are good at diagnosing things. That's interpersonal sensitivity. And the third thing that relates to our counterintuitive finding here is that they are interpersonally versatile. It is not sufficient to have mastered just 
one zone. Yeah, I'm great at cooperation, but you know what? When we're going to get into an argument, I'm not so good. Yeah, I might not go bad, but I just can't. I cannot manage being frank and forthright. I mean, we see this all the time. Some of our work has gone into to looking at institutional bullying. I mean, academics can sometimes be involved in this. And for those of you that work in academic departments, you'll have all come across a very um, eminent professor that has been very inappropriate or aggressive to a student and no one wants to go and interview that professor. But it is incumbent on someone to go and do that job and that is going to result in conflict. So it is not good enough to just be good at one of those zones. You have to be flexible and you have to be versatile. So in conclusion, what do our great interviewers do? They bring in the principles that are humanistic and Rogerian. They aren't interested in these kind of um, car salesperson techniques or little tricks that are used on people to persuade them or manipulate them or corner them. And the third thing is they're interpersonally competent, they're interpersonally sensitive, and they are interpersonally versatile. And on that, I think I'm about a minute late. So apologies for running over a little bit and perhaps we can open up for questions. Your timing was perfect. Thank you. That was a combination of wonderful and scary all at the same time. Um, but really, really excellent. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to have um, Zoe and Jim, who are discussants, um, spend a few minutes jointly talking about Lawrence's talk. Um, so to reflect on and, and kind of give us their thoughts. Um, Zoe and Jim are both senior lecturers in the School of Psychology and Counseling. Um, so Zoe, Jim, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Laura. And thank you so much, Lol. That was really, really interesting. Um, I should declare to anyone um, watching this, this lecture that might not already know that Lawrence and I know each other very well. And I've worked with Lawrence on the knowledge exchange aspects of this work. So training the police um, for many, many years. So it was very interesting to me to hear this talk because some parts of it were new. And uh. <laughs> the parts of it that, that I hadn't heard before, Lawrence, were the, the parts, that, the grim parts at the start that you've inserted um, about the kind of prior work of some of these psychologists that were involved in um, um, in some of these problematic aspects. And, and it, it got me thinking about the kind of you talked about how often when these kinds of things happened, when this bad psychology um, happened. It quite often happened at kind of stress points in history. Mm. And I just really wondered um, whether or not you felt there were kind of ways of avoiding that happening, whether or not there are kind of, I don't know, ways of anticipating that, you know, we're at a stress point. How can we avoid this kind of bad psychology happening? Mm, really good question. Thanks for that. <laughs> sure, I could answer it very efficiently. <laughs> um, well, I mean, as you know, Zoe, my other sort of area of business is, is critical incident stress debriefing. So, so, you know, when the pandemic was looming, I mean, we heard all these terms of, you know, tsunamis coming and we saw what was happening in Italy. And I mean, I remember the 23rd of January. In fact, it was shortly after another open university lecture where I was talking about um, worst case scenario planning and imagining the worst rather than, you know, you know, 10 minutes before the ball is not the time to learn to dance. I remember distinctly on the 23rd of January looking at Wuhan building 10 hospitals in 10 days. Right. That is going to be a problem. That is a signal that something is happening and it's bad. And, you know, as psychologists, we do know a little bit about um, how to anticipate worst case scenarios and the idea that preparation, adaptation and coping are good ways of dealing with with stress and things that are that are about to happen. I really do think without I mean, diverging into my other topic of interest, but but decision inertia and strategic failures and and so on. It is interesting that there's very little advice. I mean, I don't know how many people are on Twitter, but look, you know, there's all these arguments about the epidemiological modeling and blah, 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 right? I, this person thinks this and this is gonna happen, la, la, la. But no one's talking about the decision-making or the preparing for this. And we all should have known, and psychologists should know, something bad is about to happen. But we, you know, like everyone else in the UK and probably everywhere else, weren't prepared. And we, and we as psychologists should be better at that. We are. We have got some knowledge about 
forecasting and even if we're not accurate in forecasting we do know what to do to prepare for the worst or should do so i suppose that's partly my answer i guess the other thing is that you know like i said at the beginning of the lecture we don't teach this stuff we don't teach that psychologists have gone off the rails i mean certainly my undergraduates are not aware of psychologists being the bad guys but man we've been bad guys and some i mean really bad horrifically bad and you know if we're just going to sort of put our head in the hand uh, in 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 the sand and indeed in our hands and not acknowledge how much we've screwed up i mean these are real the, the, these are people that have soiled our profession so it's all very well talking about all the things that we've done that are marvelous and helpful blah 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 but we need to acknowledge the terrible things that we've done to human beings and to each other and like i said before you know if we can heal we can wound so there's not a sufficient awareness of that I do worry that what we've got now are, you know, it is a breeding ground. And this is, I mean, this is the other thing. Are we picking up weak signals now in these these reviews that I'm getting of? Yeah. yeah, well, maybe we can do this little Cialdini thing. We can bolt this little thing on here if it's not working. Or maybe if this person's not talking, we can do this. You know, psychology can't, I mean, you, know, you see on Twitter, people sort of saying, well, what are these psychologists doing behind behind the scenes? The, the behavioural insight team, are they nudging us into these behaviours? People don't like this idea that they're being secretly controlled. And some psychologists are pretty keen on that idea of secret control. And mm -hmm. that is uh, a problem. So I don't know if that answers your question, probably doesn't really. But but I, th I, I guess a acknowledgement of the fact that we can be the bad guys and have been and mm -hmm. still will be is pretty important and also perhaps as you've said education and sharing that knowledge with young and upcoming uh, academics and embedding it in the in the case of when you need to be really aware of this is when there are stress points in history it kind of this is a random tangent but it kind of reminds me of when um, you know, everyone starts to go and see psychics around the times of economic stress, you yeah. know, and just those kind of big picture um, things to be aware of, of, you know, because like you said, so many of these people, perhaps yeah. some of them at least started off with good intentions and started off with an intention to be helpful, mm. uh, be useful. And, and you do wonder about some of the pressures that we're under as academics in terms of, you know, the the RAF, in terms of uh, um, impact of our research. Uh -huh. um, you know, it, it, if some of these factors are <clears throat> the sort of factors that might encourage someone to sort of think, well, OK, that didn't work. Let's just try this slightly uh -huh. less ethical thing, but it might work. Yeah, I think you're right. Two things to pick out there. I mean, the, the thing that you're talking about psychics is pertinent, as you and as you know, Zoe, I did work with Kieran O'Keefe many years ago on on psychics, which might sound like a bizarre segue. But I always remember reading Houdini's book, which I think was called The Right Way to Do Wrong, or at least it was based on his work. And it was how to manipulate people that were suckers, you know, um, and just being aware of that is, I think, important. And, you know, if you are saying you're aware of it, you really shouldn't be doing it. It's bad enough if you're doing it unaware of it. But if you publicly declare that you are aware of how people can be manipulated, then it's even more uh, important that you avoid doing it. So that's the first sort of thought I've had. But you're quite right. The other thing is, what systems are we creating that are encouraging young academics or scholars to go down entirely the, the wrong path? I mean, it was at a DFP conference and I, you know, I was lucky enough to be, this is some years ago now, I think it was one at Newcastle. And I said to a pretty young audience, I said, don't give up on the reason why you became a forensic psychologist. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that most of you wanted to go into this to help people. You will get diverted by the pressures of producing such and such a publication in such and such a journal and achieving so many citations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and we're living through that a bit now. It is, it is challenging. There are systems that, that are problematic. Um, what we do to fight them, I see, you know, is, a, is not that easy an answer. And it, without sounding too cheesy or sort of right on or politically correct, you know, all the stuff on widening participation is important. You know, uh, some of us come from a working class background, but probably not as many as should. You know, reaching out a little bit more, a little bit earlier. And in fact, making it less uh i don't know when i when i came into university i was surprised how little attention there was 
directed at solving an immediate problem. Everything was about, you know, finding something out. There's nothing wrong with finding something out. But, you know, I do, I do think, I mean, this year is so important for sort of making us realise that. There's something really bad coming towards us. Yeah, you haven't got 25 years to think about it. Something needs to be done now. And that exerting that pressure should remind us that, that you know, it's OK to do the sort of research that many of us do, which is fast and dirty, but helps, if that makes sense. There's nothing wrong with doing that type of research. So, but the system needs to be thought about, the widening participation needs to be thought about, the diversity needs to be thought about, and not in this kind of glossed over virtue signaling way. It needs to be real. Mm. It needs to actually mean something not just ticking a box or, you know, our university is great because we've got X number of these people or X number of these people. Make it real, you know. Um, that's probably not a great answer, but that's the best no. I can muster quickly. No, it's, it's very helpful. I mean, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Jim at this point because I think he, some of the things we discussed earlier, Jim, when we looked at Lawrence's talk mm. kind of segue quite well from what Lawrence has just said. Yeah, and one of the things that struck me, Lawrence, is uh, just perhaps it's just me, but you know, you're talking through these sort of like old uh, pre-war and Second World War type psychologies. You think, oh yes, that's that's part of the dark history of the discipline before we really develop, you know, the kind of the ethical revolution, kind of post Milgram and Zimbardo and stuff. And then of course you bring it up to date to people who are still active and doing this sort of thing now, and you realise it's it's not part of the history. Um, and I, I think you're right. I don't think we do enough to teach when we, we teach students a lot about ethics of course but i don't think we do enough to situate it because mm. we do treat it as if unethical practice is part of our history that we've moved past and clearly we haven't always done that um and one of the things zoe and i uh, talked about prior to your um to your uh, presentation today is that no one thinks they're the baddies i you know i don't think that cia director rodriguez thought he was one of the baddies he probably mm. thought he was one of the goodies and and you say when you're talking to your uh, forensic psychology students you know that remember what you got into this for you got into this to make a difference and to help people and make the world a better place but so do the people who do bad things often so how do we reconcile how do we uh, you know teach up and coming psychologists more about ethics and situate ethics better so that when they think they're doing the, the right thing when they think they're the goodies they actually are yes yeah, good question i think you're right I, I i agree with you i think people don't do bad things thinking they're bad things or sort of you know twisting their moustache or cackling or <laughs> playing with their monocle as they're doing them. You know, they, they think they are the right things. And, Rod, you know, as you say in Rodriguez's book, he will say, well, look, we needed this intelligence. We needed mm -hmm. it. We had to get it. And, they, and it worked. Um, in terms of encouraging more virtuous behaviour, I mean, the thing the thing that I have found when I've been in court where I've, I've found myself up against psychologists that have um, been accused of uh, egregious acts on occasion. And I think the common thing that I see where they've gone off the rails is they've 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 uh, cut a bit of a lonely path. They've given advice without reaching out to others to kind of QA it. You know, mm. time and time again, I've seen psychologists that have, that have become sort of grotesques of their own personality. They started off on the right track and then someone said, yeah, you're really good at this. Do more of it and do more of it and do more and do more and do more. And it's a bit like the wheels, actually, when what was a virtue becomes a vice, when it's so reinforced and so unchecked by the other people that are around you that it becomes a kind of uh, a, a grotesque version of itself. I mean, Adrian Fernand, my old um, lecturer, who's a personality theorist, talk, talks about is can any virtue become a vice once it's turned up to 10. And I think there's some truth in that. And as I say, I think that the, the common error that I see college psychologists make is where they are not, I know it sounds terrible, sort of, again, sort of um, administrative and bureaucratic, but no quality assurance on the behaviour, no, mm. no advice from others, no, well, I'm thinking of doing this, but is that about right? And as you say, I think you're right, Jim, just having an ethics procedure, yes, it's good, but non-situated or non-contextualised and actually non, I think you've talked about this throughout today, you know, this idea of narratives are powerful ways of reminding us of where things have gone off the rails. And that's why I think, you know, telling the stories of Mitchell and Jessen and Helms and Rodriguez are important. 
you know, they are stories that are more memorable rather than just going in through an ethics tick box of, you know, have you, how many participants have you got and have you told them about blah, 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 blah. You know, and again, I think the thing that we're rather good at or should be rather good at is critical thinking and discussion and debate and argument and being a bit more nuanced in the way we approach things. So that so that I think teaching it, making people aware of the history of it and and situating it are all important, I think. Yeah. And I think your point about sort of you didn't quite use the term, but kind of ethical communities of academics as well, because I do wonder if part of it is you know that let's say the cia they go and ask someone will you do this thing and mm. people go no that's not ethical and they go and ask the next person the next person and sooner or later they're going to get to someone who says yes mm. and maybe that's that that person you know forging their own path as you say because they haven't got that ethical community around them mm. yeah i think i think that's so true jim because i can remember as uh, when I say a young academic, I, I was never that young when I was an academic because I came in as a mature student. But um, being asked by a government um, of another country to to kind of do something with them around deception, that they, uh, that they wanted to be able to detect deception. They really wanted to be able to detect deception in a way that you couldn't detect deception. And, and, and kind of going along to this meeting was incredibly uncomfortable because they did not want to hear the message that I was giving them, which was, no, you can't do that. That will not work. That is not scientifically viable, et cetera, et cetera. And it really struck me. I can remember I was taken away from the, from the back of the meeting in a, in a, in the back of a police car. <laughs> it was simply because they were giving me the lift to the station. I should clarify. But, but I was kind of sat in there thinking, that was so uncomfortable and I wonder whether or not other people would have kind of almost not that they would have just given in but you know that there's there's that sort of sense of you want to be able to help people you want to be able to come up with a solution for the problem that they are facing which is a viable problem but you do sometimes find yourself in this uncomfortable space of kind of um you know having to say no and perhaps at a point in your career where you're going, have I definitely done the right thing? You know, have I definitely got it all right? Um, and luckily, I had good networks of other people to kind of check with, you know, and uh, kind of clarify in my own mind. But, you know, I don't know whether or not everyone would be in that position necessarily. And I think you're right about the fact that, you know, maybe there's something going on at the individual level, but also at, at the group level of, you know, if you ask enough people, <laughs> one of them will say, we can definitely do that. Yeah. I think, I mean, again, it comes back to training, doesn't it? I mean, when we interview people for our posts, because, you know, oftentimes people that we employ to work as RAs are going to be in difficult situations. And we always give them three or four questions, which are sort of mini vignettes. You're working at this police station. This police officer asks you to do this. What are you going to say? And, you know, I've interviewed some people that have said some really shocking things. And then you're thinking, oh, my God, this person's not right for the job. But then you kind of think, well, where's this, where is this person going to get a job? They're probably going to get a job somewhere. Um, so, but, you know, I think I think the training, the sort of putting people in situations before they're in the real thing is helpful. I mean, like you, Zoe, I've had a couple of occasions where I've been made to feel most uncomfortable that I haven't given the answer that was wanted. Mm. And then you kind of, you know, you're quickly ushered out of the room for being unhelpful. Um, so, but being, you know, it's difficult for people, isn't it? You know, yeah. for, for young students that are master students working with a, I don't know, a detective constable that's giving them access to data, that's a, that's a tough gig. That's a tough place to be. So they need to be prepared for it. They need to know what that looks like before it's real. Mm. Uh, on a kind of slightly related note, and this is perhaps a bit of a um, a hard question to answer, but uh, you know, with your phrase, um, I can't quite remember exactly what it was, but it was something about anything that can do good can do harm. Mm -hmm. Do you worry about your own, you know, the model that you've developed, the orbit model, um, in that respect? Yeah, I do. I do, I, I, and I have some evidence that I've got good cause to be worried. I mean, without, I mean, this is being recorded, isn't it? So I've got to be careful what I say. You know, we've had certain parties say, well, yeah, yeah, this is all very well. And we like the wheels and we like the Rogerian stuff, but can't you add this bit to it? Mm. What about if you add that bit to it? And they're very keen on, you know, here's, here's the machine that you've created that's supposed to be making a cake. And someone says, yeah, but can't we add a little bit of arsenic to it? 
And you're like, no, because it's now not a walnut cake. You're actually trying to kill someone with it. And, you know, there are parts of it that could be weaponized. I mean, for those of you that know anything about the work on interrogation, you'll know that in the US they've been using a technique called the read technique. Mm. And that's been around for a long time and, and based on a model that actually subsequently they found out the specific case that it emanated from was a false confession. So if ever there was a reason to not use it, that was the reason to not use it. But it's been, it's been very popular and it's a technique which on a surface level looks like you're being quite nice you know you'll say to the you'll sit sit close well no it's okay and you can tell me and you know you don't need to worry about it too much and i can see where you're coming from so it has a sort of the glamour or illusion of caring but its intention is not its intention is confession driven and my, my worry is that with orbit that if you start adding things to it if you add arsenic to the cake it is to kill someone it's not to feed them and, you know, what we do to guard against that is really difficult because you can train various different populations with it. And we've trained all sorts of different people with it. But I do have concerns about it being weaponized. Um, but on the other hand, you know, what do you do about it? You, you, you try and create sort of quality control around it. You try not to authorize people to use it unless they've been trained adequately. But to some extent, once it's out there, it is out there mm. and it is very hard to control and you can't. You can't completely control the mutations that other people are going to impose on it. And it may well be being used in other ways or, or alongside other stuff that's inappropriate. Um, but I guess on the other hand, if you, you know, if you, if you just sort of say, well, then we can't let it out at all, then, you know, what's the alternative? If you just carry on with read all these other, all, all these other techniques, you just got to keep pushing, Yeah. you know, doing things like this and doing public promotion and making it clear in your books and publications that it's this and it's definitely not this. Mm. When it becomes this, when you add this bit to it, it's not orbit anymore. Forget the idea that it's orbit. Yeah. So, and I, I, you know, I think you do in in your books and, you know, I mean, I've seen you present this probably a hundred times. Uh, you do make that very clear. You know, the authenticity of it is mm. uh, is absolutely, you know, integral. Um, yeah. There's some. Sorry, yeah, there's some some questions in the chat. And actually, that's a perfect segue to the first one, which is from Graham Pike. He wants to know what do you think the next MK Ultra scandal involving psychology is going to be? <laughs> That's a good question, Graham. I suspect it will be something to do with the pandemic. Who knows? I mean, I would imagine, you know, if you if you can, I suspect there will be some um, public inquiry into the extent to which psychologists were trying to uh, um, behaviorally manipulate people. Perhaps that that may be a thing. I don't know. I you know, I'm, I've got no particular uh, knowledge of of what psychologists were doing but you know and I mean from what I see there seems to be a, a varied clustering of people that were advising on sage but maybe behind the scenes there's something that's more sinister I mean if you're a sort of you know, I never used to be a conspiracy theorist until I got older and grew up but the more the older you get the more you realize that some of these ludicrous conspiracy theories actually end up being true occasionally so perhaps something around the pandemic I'm sure there'll be some public inquiry into to psychological interventions or so-called non um, what do they call them non pharmacological interventions there'll be something on that I would imagine who knows? But again, I mean, in, in our arena, I, I dare say it'll come up again when times get desperate. I mean, we've been doing it since the 16th century. If something really bad happens, someone somewhere will drift. They'll drift across the line, I would imagine. So, but yeah. Don't want to end on a dark note, Graham, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there, there are a few other questions, so it's still let's 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 let's, let's still uh, end on the high. So, something nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Johanna Moscow has asked. Um, could you please comment on what you think the role of creativity and imagination are being able to interview in an interpersonally versatile way, as well as the diversity of interviewers own lived experience, um, as you described the expert interviewer. This is someone who combines the abilities of the humanist therapist with those of the stand up comedian tackling heckler. Right. In interesting phrasing of the question. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of how we can increase empathy. And, you know, if you look at the stuff uh, that I've seen, and I may be completely unaware of a, of a literature that's out there, but I don't see anything very compelling on empathy at the moment, you know, or how to measure it, certainly not psychometrically. I mean, there are measures of it, but I think they're pretty unconvincing. Um, I mean, maybe Emily, who's 
my wife would be more uh, appropriate to answer this because she works in a clinical domain but she will often tell you that if you're using proper clinical empathy it's actually quite cold it isn't warm the last thing you want to hear as a therapist is yeah i understand exactly how you feel because you think well actually you don't you don't know how i feel at all um but what we do to encourage it i'm not so sure i mean maybe there's something there is something in this kind of narrative psychology or you know stories as as ways to encourage empathy in fact i've re written a paper which um i wrote on the back of the last thing where i was talking about you know how to actively imagine worst case scenarios it encourages preparedness for it uh this ability to imagine i think is interesting i mean certainly historically you know imaginative acts or drama there's some evidence that those are the things that 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 helped change certain attitudes i mean i was reading something the other day about um dickens work and how um you know his dramatizations were were the things that seemed to encourage people to to be more empathic about people that 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 were were struggling with poverty and hitherto you know all the rational persuasion stuff hadn't worked but you know when you're immersed in someone's life story that 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 maybe makes you a little bit more um uh empathic towards it I, sorry i'm really drifting off the point of the question here um the the simple answer is i don't know the answer i'd be really interested to pursue that because that is the one thing we are really struggling with cops you know some cops come in and they do have a good feel for um being prepared to listen to an extent where they will explore and be curious about someone's life and others that just just don't go there they can't they can't seem to use that that they can't seem to be to use a sufficient cognitive power to, to get where they need to be i don't know what the answer is i'm waffling which is clearly waffling around the answer i don't know i'd really like to know some thoughts on it jim you've got a finger can, up yeah can I find, I, unfortunately it's not a thought worth as much as a question which is um i i would imagine the police find it relatively easy to empathize with some people you know, the, a sort of a, a deserving sort of, oh, I can understand why you've been in that difficult life situation that's led you mm. into this criminal career and so on. Mm. And, but then transferring that to somebody who's done something horrific, like a, an act of terrorism, a major sexual offence, whatever it might be. I wonder, if, is there some way of taking that relatively easy empathic starting point and just kind of gradually shifting them along? And And has that been tried and failed? I don't know. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. You've you've prompted me to think of something else there because because our CT guys and girls are relatively much better than our um, guys and girls that deal with sex offenders. Now, actually, there's an argument. I was talking to a senior police officer about this, and he quite rightly said, um, "Is there some danger in encouraging them?" to think through and imagine what it is that has led this person to um, uh, be looking at 50,000 indecent images of children. And I think he might have a point. You know, if you've worked in the CSA, IOC, um, Child Sexual Exploitation and Abuse and Indecent Image Area as I have for 12 years, there's maybe a good argument for not being too empathic with those offenders. Because if you're doing that job day in, day out, and of course, don't forget some of these people that have to interview these people, have to go through their hard drive and look at everything that's on that hard drive. That is a major ask to imagine that person to then be empathic towards that offender. And if you're doing that day in, day out for 12 years, that could destroy you. So, you know, I I think you might be right, Jim. There, there, there may be a way of taking them from here and shifting them up. But maybe there's a danger in doing that in some of these areas, perhaps. Uh, and and is there a way? I mean, we had we, we've had military interrogators that that have served in war zones and seen friends with arms and legs blown off. And there again, that is a hard ask to to you know have to dehumanise the enemy to do what they do, and then rehumanise them to interview them. Mm. Um, and that also is a hard ask. But what we tend to find with the good interviewers there is they can compensate with the other qualities, the non-judgmental stuff, the analytical stuff, the very coggy stuff. Um, that doesn't have the same, doesn't seem to have the same cognitive properties as empathy. So it might be that if you're low on empathy, you can compensate by accelerating these other qualities. But um, yeah. I'm going to try to, excuse me, I'm going to try to bring us back to a higher note um, with another question. Uh, so this is one from Jackie. 
what can be done to encourage an interest in psychology earlier? Uh, she was thinking about sparking an interest in children who aren't white or middle class. I mean, she's not sure it was ever considered as a career path in her school. Yeah, I saw that question, and I think it's a good question, and I think the answer is not simple. I mean, you know, lots of universities have been trying to do this, some more successfully than others, but no university very successfully, I have to say. So I think it's a bigger, wider issue about how we make publicly available um, what it is that psychologists are doing. And actually, I mean, I used to be quite resistant to, well, semi-resistant to um, doing TV slots, you know, quite often I get in, uh, invited by the crime and investigation channel to do yada yada and blah, blah, blah. And you think, oh, God, you know, do I really want to do that? And I know they're going to cut it so that I sound like a complete moron. But, you know, maybe we as psychologists need to do a bit more media training because that is often the access point, I think. And I think many of us, me included, I'm not, I'm not being particularly critical of any specific psychologists, don't come across that well on TV. I, I can't think of many psychologists that come across that well. And one of the people that always used to used to come across, I think, really well, who Zoe will know, I think, is Richard Wiseman. You know, it was kind of exciting. It was short and punchy. It was clear. I got the message, you know, and we do need some more characters like that that, that aren't um, over intellectualizing things that, that are, it's a bit more fun. You know, we have other public scientists that are pretty good, but I'm not sure we have any great media psychologists. So that's probably part of the answer. Universities need to be a, get, get a bit wiser about how they present themselves and celebrate psychology. And like I say, I think, you know, lot, lots of kids want to get into doing something because it's hands on and it's problem solving. Mm -hmm. And then we get them through the system and then they drift away because it's not problem solving anymore. It's just looking at what a brain does, what, what bit the brain lights up when you subject it to X, Y, Z stimulus. I have no issue with that. But I just think, you know, you know, in many undergraduate degrees, it's very sanitized. It's very uh, it's almost like scientists have to well, we're proper scientists. You know, we are proper scientists. So we're going to do all this quite boring scientific stuff and nothing terribly exciting. So I think we just need to be a little bit more imaginative, maybe a little bit more media friendly uh, mm -hmm. and a bit more problem solving. -y. Yeah, I think it, 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 in a way it feels like we've kind of. Um, overcorrected because I remember when I first started studying psychology as a as a you know 20 year old or whatever I was when I did my first degree kind of feeling that psychology was very self-conscious at that time it was a long time ago um but you know kind of we were so worried about being scientific and being viewed as a science we sometimes weren't prepared to nail our flags to the mast you know whereas then mm you know, you get programs that will say, well, we've found this bone and we can tell you what the entire entire dinosaur looks like, you know, <laughs> so there was a sort of a disparity between what psychology was sort of prepared to do and what other disciplines were maybe prepared to do. And maybe that's appropriate, but I think sometimes you're right. There's too much of the, we are definitely scientists right, uh, rather than the kind of making it accessible and the knowledge exchange part, which I think is is super important. Mm. I think you're right. I really agree with that. And I think, you know, not being too worried about when you're communicating absolute precision, getting 80 percent of the basic message across is more important than getting 99 percent of the precise message not across at all. Well, God, that wasn't a good example of what I was trying to say, was it? It was completely the opposite <laughs> of what I was trying to say. But yeah, I mean, you know, we're scared of simplifying things. But the reality is media is quick. It's fast. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's got to, and not everything's flash and bang and exciting and blah. I mean, the other thing, sorry, segueing again, you know, Zoe, you and I have talked about this, but in terms of interrogation specifically, I literally cannot think of one single dramatization of any interrogation or interview anywhere. And I've enjoyed a lot of crime dramas. I mean, I do watch crime dramas that has a decent interrogation in it. Mm. I mean, none, literally none. Mm. So, you know, my God, I think that would help, you know, so there's some some decent dramas that actually portray not just the reality of what works, but the reality of what works in an exciting and dramatic way without yeah. having to have a cop bang their fist on the table. Or, you know, there was a programme I was watching the other day. I think it's a programme was was called Innocent. Um, anyway, it's a very good cop drama and everything about it was quite authentic, apart from the interrogation, mm. which suddenly both the cops became asses. 
you know, they're quite heroic in everything else they did and quite virtuous. And then suddenly in the interview room, because they had a sex offender or a murderer, they just became awful to this person. I think that's not heroic or mm. interesting or, or or accurate in any way. So, you know, more dramatizations that, that, that I mean, I, you know, partly, perhaps shamefully, I got sort of interested in the whole profiling thing because the silence of the lambs, that was my segue into it. And we'd all have our fascinations. I mean, it was nothing like the reality of it, but that's what sort of brought me in. So, mm. um, but yeah. I think that's a problem then, that there, there are so many popular and often very well made um, misrepresentations. You know, Jack Bauer always manages to get good <sighs> information by torturing someone. Yeah. Every FBI profile always manages to track that, even though in real life their techniques don't work. We've got a lot of stuff to overcome, I think, in terms of without resorting to pop psychology ourselves. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right, Jim. It's, it sounds amusing, but if you read Mark Fallon's book, you know, FBI agents and CIA agents and Jack Bauer's stuff in 24 was happening at the time of 9-11. And that genuinely was their reference point, not least because they thought that, that the general public would also find that acceptable and palatable. Well, why? Because yeah. Jack Bauer could do it. So, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. But and actually, they're probably Mark, half right because yeah, well, Mark will argue that, find it acceptable yeah. because of that. Yeah, I mean, Fallon will argue that 24 did a lot of damage. I mean, unwittingly, of course, because it never set out to do it. But but it does cause damage. If, if if your heroes are people that beat people up, you've got a problem. I mean, we had the, the great pleasure of having Asbjorn Raplow talk to our students the other week, and he was talking about managing the Brevik inquiry. And, you know, that's a, that is a serious bit of pressure where this guy, you know, one of the first things that Brevik said in the interview room was, you know, cells four and five are ready to go. And you can imagine the pressure of being that interview interviewer who's then told, well, get that information out of that guy. You know, you'd feel pretty desperate. But to be fair to Asbjorn, he stuck to the values that Norway had instigated around treating people with humanity and compassion and non-judgment. And the guy talked. So, you know, if you stick to the principles that you know work and aren't going to get you into hot water later, that is actually your best chance of working. But do we ever see that dramatised? Never. It's no, always... if anything, it's like there's a tension between ethics and effectiveness. It's like we know this will work, but the rules won't let us do it, damn it. But actually, mm -hmm. it's the ethical yeah. practice in real life Absolutely. that is effective. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. You know, when I, I've worked with cops in India and they said, well, yeah, don't tell me all this stuff about ethics. I said, well, OK, I won't tell you stuff about ethics. This is the stuff that works. How fortunate that it also happens to be ethical. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. It's, I, I think one of the other things, um, you know, just thinking about how to how to get psychology out there for for younger students. Years ago, I used to see fairs for secondary school students, and they could come and they could look around at all the different sciences. And psychology was there, and we would offer very short, fun kind of experiments that they could take part in. So we'd give them a a Stroop test, and then we would explain to them in under a minute why that worked. Now, there was no way that was effectively conveying what actually was going on, but it got them interested. And I don't know, and I think it probably is not nearly as exciting as looking at a bone of a dinosaur mm -hmm. and being able to see what the dinosaur looks like. But I do think something about pulling people in in little bite-sized chunks, which is very similar to the media, um, doing it that same way, but just getting students there, being able to, to touch things in the experiments and to actually go through it. Mm. Um, in a live way might be another way to excite students. Mm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. The little hooks are the things that matter. So, yeah. Um, there's one other question um, from Sue Coughlin. Curious, Lawrence, you use the term cops and not police. Is there a reason for that? There's no particular reason for that. It's just nomenclature that I guess is just speed. I don't know why I use cops. It's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I always use cops slightly shorter than police. I tend to speak quickly, so I'm getting ideas out quickly. There's no particular reason for that. There's no, there's no sinister reason, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> Zoe may say otherwise, but not as far as I'm aware. <laughs> I see there's a, a point from Paul Stenner about alexithmia, um, which I will definitely look up. Um, yeah, thank you. Perfect. I was just going to point that one out. So thank you. Um, Lawrence, Zoe, Jim, any other comments, last thoughts? No, just that, that I think that's been really fascinating, very um, appropriate at a time like this to make us all sort of reflect on the ethics.
ethics of our practice um, as well as the effectiveness of our practice and trying to get that balance right and, and it's good to sort of bring that to the forefront of your mind I think so that I've found that really useful even though I'm very familiar with the the content it's useful to have it in that it framed in that way yeah I, I have nothing to add but my agreement sorry <laughs> Well, thank you for having me, guys. It's, it's been a fun session, so um, keep in touch. And thanks for being such gracious hosts and uh, navigating me through the tech, which is never my favourite bit. And hopefully, you know, we'll all be able to see each other in three dimensions. This is hopefully my last two dimensional thing until we're, I go back into the real three dimensional oh, world. So and I will see I you next so. week, Zoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. OK, so thank you so much, Lawrence, You're very welcome. Zoe thanks and Jim, really appreciate it. Great talk.